to Jerusalem. Thank you, Jesus, that you... here in this place, we worship the true King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's worship God together here in this place. Amen.
this time, our usher is going to come around to collect our connecting cards and our ties and offerings. So we can pop those into the baskets coming around. And I'm just going to dismiss our kids for their classes out the back door here, grades one to six or one to five. And I'm going to direct your attention up to the screen for our morning announcements. Good morning, Gateway. My name is Jenny Smith, and here are a few things we want you to know about this week. Have you ever wondered what could be good about a day where the Son of God was beaten, tortured, and put to death on a cross? Why do Christians around the world gather together to remember the death of Jesus? We invite you to join with us and all of the churches in town on Good Friday to reflect on the penalty of sin and the reason that Jesus died. This is a special event to consider as we head into the Easter weekend because it doesn't end there. Be sure to come back on Easter Sunday as we celebrate together the most important event in history because this is where everything changed. Easter Sunday is all about the importance of Jesus' resurrection and how Jesus is still alive and changing lives today. Hope is alive and we would love for you to join in that celebration. Start inviting family and friends now to experience a really impactful Easter weekend. Easter reminds us of the greatest hope that there is, the risen Savior, Jesus. We invite you to come this Easter Sunday as we remember and celebrate Jesus' resurrection. Easter is for everyone as we experience Jesus' life, we remember his death, and we celebrate his resurrection. We want to begin to pray for everyone who's attending one of our Easter services that they would encounter this hope that only Jesus can give. For Easter Sunday, there will be three morning services to choose from as usual. This is a perfect time to invite friends and family who may not normally visit a church to join with you. We hope to see you there. There will be an Easter sunrise service held down at the river on Easter Sunday. There will be a short devotional, a time of worship, and baptisms. We will be baptizing people polar bear dip style, so if you would like to be baptized on Easter Sunday at the river, please let us know. Get ready for Rooted, our 10 session series on Sunday nights. Connect with God, your church community, and discover your purpose. Each week, we're going to dive into five Bible studies and two special sessions on prayer and serving. Whether you're a longtime follower or you're new to faith, Rooted could be a great next step for you to consider. RSVP at the link below. Thanks for joining us this morning. We're so glad you're here. Have a great week. Well, good morning, and again, welcome to Gateway Church. My name is Wes, and it's, uh, it's a joy to be with you all this morning. Uh, today we're jumping back into our series called Conversion Cluster, where we're looking at the moment of conversion, what happens when we cross that line of faith. Because although it's true, as many of you know, when we place our faith in Jesus and what he's done, we're, we're saved. Uh, that word saved there, though, the, the salvation that we're given has so many aspects to it, like a, a multifaceted diamond or like a crown. Um, there are many parts to salvation. For example, we chatted about justification and how we're seen as righteous in the eyes of God in that moment. And then last week, Steve talked about redemption and how we've been bought back by the blood of Jesus uh, from slavery and sin to now freedom in Christ. And today we're continuing on in this series to another facet of, or, or part of salvation that, that happens the moment we're saved, the moment we convert, the moment we place our faith in Jesus. And interestingly, I think this part of the conversation is one that a lot of us have actually grown quite numb to words. Uh, because it's something that if you've been a part of the church for any extended amount of time, you've heard quite often. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think it's something that we've gotten maybe just a little deaf to. And uh, again, that, that might sound weird, but, but growing used to things is just kind of what we do as people. And sometimes that is a very positive thing, and sometimes that can be a negative thing. For example, in the context of work, this has been extremely positive for me. Um, you see Steve's awful dad jokes that you hear on Sunday. He actually does those in the rest of the week, if you didn't know. Um, and I've actually, I've grown numb to them now. It's great. They used to get a rise out of me, and now they just, I just, I just ignore them. You just, they just go past me. It's a, a helpful tool in this case. Um, <clears throat> on the negative side would be in my marriage when it comes to the context of, of Beth and cars. Um, you see, we got two cars, and this is from when Beth wasn't on mat leave. She needed one to get to work. And a few years ago, we had these two absolute beaters, just hunks of junk that we loved because, you know, they got us from point A to B. But because of this, I was quite aware um, that things could go wrong with these cars. I would always be checking levels of oil and whatever else. And 
um, best maybe less so. And, and of course, given these were old cars, um, things would eventually go wrong with them every once in a while. And I, I realized very shortly after Beth started driving these cars that I needed to periodically get into the car that she drove because I would come in and to my surprise and apparently hers, um, there would be a loud noise when the car started. Like at one time, um, the power steering was going, and if you've never heard that, it sounds kind of like this whirring sound. And so I, I turn it on, and all you hear, and I'm sitting in the car with your, her, and you hear this woo, 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 woo kind of sound. And I look at Beth, and, and I go, how long has this been happening? And no lie, she looked back at me with a smile on her face, and she says, what sound? Um, I, I was blown away. Um, it, Growing used to things, it cannot always be a good thing. And look, to be clear, there are countless annoying things that I do that Beth has gotten used to, but I'm up here and she's not, so that's, that's kind of where that is. Anyways, my, my point being, again, it's, it's not great sometimes um, when we grow used to certain things. And I, I think in our case today, the doctrine that we're talking about, this aspect of conversion that we're focusing on, um, it's one that we have grown used to, and I, and I think that's to our detriment. Today's title is called The Radiance of Reconciliation. I'm continuing begrudgingly with this cheesy alliteration that we've been doing, but today's topic is reconciliation between us and God. And it's my hope for us today that for some of us, we discover for the first time maybe how amazing this truth is, and for others, we rediscover how amazing it is. Um, because friends, I, I think if we, can, if we can grasp what this part of conversion means, if we can actually put it into our heads and our hearts, nothing can be the same. This, this doctrine is life and faith changing. It's that amazing. And so to explore this today, to explore reconciliation, we're going to be diving again into the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8. And I'm going to invite you to open up your Bibles now. We'll be looking at verses 14 to 17. If you don't have a Bible, just put up your hand. Our connecting team would love to get you one. Um, but as you open up your Bibles, as you find Romans there, I, I want to fill you in on some of the context of this chapter. It begins with these incredible words, therefore... Um, there, are, there, is no, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is almost a summary of what we've talked about so far in this series. And in light of this, Romans 8, 1 to 13 kind of primarily contrasts two kinds of livings we now have um, um, options of participating in. Uh, we can live in life in the flesh or a life in the spirit. That's what Paul kind of gives us. The flesh here is not our physical bodies, but think um, of our sinful nature that we have, the bondage that we used to be in sin before we met Jesus. And the spirit here isn't this kind of like disembodied living, but it's lives of righteousness and freedom that we can actually participate in through the Holy Spirit. Um, as followers of Jesus, we've been given the Holy Spirit, God himself, to, to walk with us, to empower us to live lives of holiness. We're not just freed from our sins, but we're empowered to live holy lives that please God. And, and Paul makes this very clear in these verses that precede the passage today. But then as, as almost as if he knows how quickly we can get back into this mentality of a, a good work salvation or a, a performance-based or a merit-based salvation, Paul finishes uh, this part of the letter with some of the sweetest and most assuring words in the scriptures. And we're going to pick those up starting in verse 14 to, today. And they read like this. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again, rather the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in, the sufferings, uh, in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So Paul begins here with almost giving his thesis statement for this portion of the letter. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, those who have crossed the line of faith and who are empowered by the Spirit now are the children of God. His point is simple. We've been welcomed into the family of God. And this is what reconciliation is, that we were once enemies and now we have been brought close to God. But the question is, how? How has this been achieved? How does this happen? Because if we don't know how, then you're not going to be able to answer what this actually means. And so Paul continues on by noting that the spirit we receive, the Holy Spirit, uh, the one who marks us as his children, um, is not one that has us living in fear as in slaves who feared their masters, but instead, through the spirit, we have been adopted. So Paul makes it clear. We've been adopted into the family of God. But the term he says here is actually very, very specific. He says we've been adopted to sonship. You see, Paul here is referencing a particular event that happened in the Roman world. 
Um, adoption actually rarely, if ever, happened in the Roman world, but there was one exception to this rule. And to explain that, um, let me paint you a, a, a bit of a help, uh, I think a helpful scenario when I talk about this topic. Um, imagine with me for a moment, you're a Roman man and you own a small farm and you have your family and your house and it supports everybody there. You have a wife and maybe two daughters, okay? You're living a happy life, a good life, nothing above your means, but again, it's a good life. Now imagine you take sick one day and you're quite sick. And you know your day is coming. You, you don't have long. If you were this first century Roman man, what would be your number one concern right now? Without a doubt, no question, it would be who is the heir of your estate? Who gets all your money and land? Who will take care of your family? And all of those kinds of questions. Now imagine in this scenario, you don't have any remaining male relatives because it might have gone to them because that's normally who it would go to. You're actually the last male in your line. If that's the case, you have two options. Option number one, you could pass and you could leave your estate to your wife. Uh, women at this time, they weren't technically considered property, but they were very much second-class citizens. And so there were risks associated. What this means is that yes, your wife now owns everything and, and she, given her status, um, was able to work, but she wouldn't have been able to do maybe exactly the job that you were doing. The farm would be far more difficult for her to run. And then most of all, maybe the biggest concern is that if she would ever marry, which is probably the wisest thing for her to do to keep her family safe, yours and everything you own would become another man's. So everything you worked for, uh, all, it, all that is yours would be another person's, and your name especially would essentially be gone in the Roman cult culture. You'd be forgotten. So that's option number one. Option number two is usually a little more appealing in this case. Instead of waiting to die and giving everything you own to your wife, who again, even if she was an amazing woman that you trusted, it might not have been the wisest thing to do, your other option is that you could adopt someone. Now, this someone wouldn't have been a person of high class because they have their own families and money and wealth, but you could adopt somebody who didn't have as much as you. You could adopt a male slave or a servant, one of your hired hands, uh, one of the young men who worked for you. And then uh, legally, once this was done, when you pass, all that is yours will pass on to this young man who has taken your name by being adopted as your son. Your name lives on, your wealth lives on, your family is in safe hands, and this young man's life has been transformed. He went from a slave to a son overnight, just like that. All of his debts, his whole past, his old name associated with, associated with slavery was gone. And in a moment, this person becomes a new person, a new son. This is what adoption to sonship is referencing, not that exact hypothetical scenario, but this is the context you need to understand. Paul is referencing very specifically Roman adoption, where you would take somebody of a lower class, a slave or a, a servant, and you would bestow upon them all the rights and privileges, all the intimacies and love that is due a firstborn son in the Roman world. And Paul then applies that to us, male and female alike, rich and poor. You can imagine somebody like a, a poor slave woman in the Roman culture hearing this, somebody who could never dream of this honor. He's saying that even you who have faith in Jesus, who are led by the Spirit, regardless of your station in life, regardless of your gender, regardless of your past, you have been adopted into the family of God, you who had nothing. You have been given all the rights, all the inheritance, and all the love a firstborn is due in the family of God. And this is why when we look to verse 17, we see Paul writing these words. He says, look, now if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If we have been adopted, if we've been brought into the family, we aren't just placed into it as servants or slaves. We're not step-siblings or extended families. We are heirs, heirs of the kingdom and co-heirs with Christ. Everything that is due Jesus, everything that he has is actually now ours. Every honor, every glory, every intimacy with the Father, every love and kindness shown from the Father to the Son is actually now ours. There is nothing and no one that can separate us from God the Father. We are as close and as intimate and as loved as we will ever be. And the term that we use in theology to reflect this is reconciliation. We have been totally and irrevocably reconciled to God, meaning that there is no enmity, nor barriers, nor partitions between us and God right now. We are offered complete and total intimacy with the Father whenever we desire it. In the simplest of terms, as Paul summed it up, you could say it like this, we are now children of God. And that's something we hear all the time, right? If this 
is incredible news. But I'll be honest, guys, I think this is the part of the gospel, the part of conversion that, like I said, I think we've actually become pretty numb to. Now, some of you today are here for maybe the first time, and you're hearing this, and this is amazing truth, and I, at least I hope there's somebody like that. But for others of you, you're like me. You've been around here for a little while. You've, you've been in the church. Maybe you're a student. You've grown up here at Gateway, and you've heard this time and time again. You're a child of God. We sing it on this stage, right? We say these truths in Sunday school. We proclaim it here in the front. You've probably been in Bible studies on the topic of being a child of God in your identity. And I think it's, it's good. We should talk about this all the time, that foundationally, before anything else, we've been reconciled to God, and our identity is in the fact that we are his children. That's so good, so good. But again, sometimes... I think the truth goes cold. And it's, it's not the truth's fault. It's our fault. We just grow numb to these things. We, as people, we, we take things for granted all the time, and sometimes we do that even with God's word. I'm no exception here. These words, as I've gone back over them, have been life to me this week. They've been such a good reminder of who I am. Specifically for me, what stood out were actually Paul's words at the end of verse 15 as I was kind of studying them this week, that and I, and I actually think that if, if, look, if we can understand what the last part of this verse means, then, then we'll get why we, we can't take this passage for granted. We'll, we'll get why these words actually, they just, they just, they don't let us. The words Paul closes with in this verse, if you understand them in their context, they're actually quite shocking. Again, Paul writes this in verse 15. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Those are the words I want to focus on. By him we cry, Abba, Father. The statement here is one that is often remarked as one of the most tender and beautiful parts of the whole of the scriptures. And it's a bit of a, a culmination of what we focused on so far, that because of the Spirit of God, because he resides in us, because of what Jesus has done, we now have intimate access to the Father. And the expression of this is the fact that we can now cry out to God, Abba, Father. The word there, Abba, is an Aramaic word that young children would say to their fathers. If you translate it literally right now in our context today, you would probably say it means daddy. It's a name of endearment. It's a name of intimacy. And, and most of all, it's a name of phonetic simplicity. It's a word that would have been said by a very, very young child who couldn't pronounce much else. You can hear it in, in the word, the simplicity of it, Abba, right? You could imagine a, a, a toddler saying that, like one might say dada or mama today. It, it's meant to connote deep, deep intimacy and dependency. This is the kind of access that, that Paul says you have to the Father, a childlike access. But this name of God, this name that we get to call him, Abba, we have to be careful when we read it because of our modern ears. It might not seem that shocking to us. Again, to, to call God Father in our church context today is, is anything but shocking. In fact, it's the norm. It's what we do. But this word here, Abba, in Paul's context is, is very much not the norm. It's, it's actually quite the opposite. And to understand that context today, we need to have a, a brief discussion about names in general. If you haven't heard or you're new here, you wouldn't know I was away for about five weeks, and that's because Beth gave birth to this beautiful baby girl we've named Annabelle Esther Jane Dixon. Um, this, is, this is a photo of her. Yeah, she's cute, right? I've been told, yeah, we, li we like her, we like her. Um, you hear funny things, I, you hear funny things when, when people, <laughs> when, people uh, when you have a new kid. Um, a lot of people, one of my favorite things that they've said to me, it's this, wow, your kid is actually cute. Um, <laughs> And that seems like a nice compliment at first glance until you realize the person who said that is straight up ready to lie to your face. You know, like, there's a world that exists where they look at this kid and they go, oh, she's not that cute, but I'm just going to tell Wes anyways. I'm not saying I want to hear otherwise, but like, that's what that's saying. Anyways, that has nothing to do with today, just a funny thing. Um, I, I bring her up um, because Beth and I, we had to enter, like all parents do, into the process of naming our child. Um, and the naming process, if you don't know, can be quite a long and lengthy one. I mean, sometimes it's quick, but for Beth and I, it kind of took a while. We, we sort of, you know, we had a name set, and then we found out it was a girl, and we're like, ah, maybe not, we'll have to switch it up. And there was tons of debate on it, because naming a kid is a big deal. Um, there were names that I liked and were meaningful that Beth didn't like, and vice versa, and we'd go back and forth and back and forth, and, and sometimes Beth would shoot down one of the names I liked, and then out of sheer spite, I would shoot down one of her names, even though I thought it was fine. I, it's personal, and there was a lot of debate, and that's because, as people, for us, names 
they matter, right? They're important to us. How we refer to someone means a lot. This Annabelle, right? This is what this little girl is going to be called for the rest of her life. This is the first real bit of info that you guys get to know about her. It's her name. It tells you something, even if just a little, about who she is. Um, her name, when it's literally translated, uh, translated means beautiful grace. Um, now, we like the name. We have family connections. But we thought that was a beautiful, beautiful thing to pray over her, that God would surround her with his beautiful grace. Um, her name, Esther, it's her grandmother's name on, on Beth's side. She's a, she's a wonderful woman who we respect. Um, Look, everybody in here, your name means something. It was chosen for a reason. Your parents chose that name. Parents, you've been there. You know what I mean. It's a lot. Names matter. Names, flat out, they are important to us as people. They, they convey things about who we are and who people wish us to be. And this was certainly true in Paul's day, too. In antiquity, naming was a huge undertaking. In the Roman mind and even the Jewish culture, there were kind of notes of actually destiny tied into your name. Um, it wasn't just that you were hoping that, that, that the meaning of their name would somehow influence them, but, but the idea was who you were named after or the reason you were named could actually be part of who you were, who you would become. Um, and so names were so, so important for the Jewish person. And, and the reason I, I, I bring this up is that the, the most important name, the most crucial name, the name that defined for the Jewish people so much of who they were, but also who they followed was the name of God. Did you know, because this isn't actually always clear to everybody, that God actually gave the people of Israel a special name for them to call him? Just to them. Jump back with me to Exodus 3, and we see this moment where Moses comes across the burning bush, right? And he has this incredible encounter with God where God calls Moses to bring his people out of the grips of slavery from Pharaoh. And Moses, who, if you didn't know, is the great excuse giver, um, God says, let's do this. You're my guy. And he goes, I'm not your guy, God. There's no way I can't do this. And God goes, don't worry. I'm going to go with you. Okay, that's, that's the scenario. Moses then, with this incredible sass to the God of the universe, goes, okay, God, suppose I do this. Let's just imagine it. What would I say... Who do I tell the Israelites sent me? This is what God says in verse 15. Say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Now, if you read this verse in the English, it's hard to catch, but there is a special name in this verse where God reveals himself as, and it's the word, the Lord. You'll see it up there on the screen. In your English translations, uh, many of them, if you open your Bibles or your apps, wherever it is, you'll see that it has the word, the Lord, in capital letters. And it does this in many other places in the Old Testament. And you might think that's to show reverence, but that's not it. See, if you look at this verse in the Hebrew, this is the Hebrew word that comes up where it says the Lord in capital in your translations. Here's the catch, though. This word does not translate as Lord. It doesn't at all. This word uh, does not translate as all. Um, we can go, actually, let's go back to the, to the Hebrew word there. I just want to see it for a second. Um, this word is called the tetragrammaton. It's the four-letter word. This four-letter word is the divine name that God gives Moses um, and the Israelites. This is the intimate and very specific name that he tells them to call him. Here's the catch, though. We don't know how this name is pronounced. We don't know how to say it. That's part of the reason why we put the Lord in capitals. We don't even know how to say God's name. And that's because the Jewish people over the years considered the name to be so holy and so precious that they would refuse to say God's name out loud. I'm not kidding. Out of reverence, they would actually say other things when reading the name. They would say words like this. They would say Hashem, literally meaning the name. So they would read the verse. They would say uh, say to the Israelites, Hashem, the God of your fathers. Or they would say the word Adonai, which means Lord. They would say, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers. And it's because of this practice of reverence, of skipping this name given to the people by God, that we have the Lord in capital letters in our translations to show you that this is the name that's there in the text. But you might be saying to yourself right now, well, Wes, the word's right there, but can't we just sound it out? And the answer is, sort of. See, the scriptures, they were originally written in ancient Hebrew, which is much like modern Hebrew today. It doesn't have any vowels. All those letters on that screen are consonants. 
The letters, uh, sorry, the, the consonants in Hebrew, what we read today, didn't come until about the 6th century AD when a group of monks called the Masoretes added vowels for us who don't really read Hebrew so we can know how things sounded easier. But the issue is this, because the Jewish people skipped the name so much, by the time the Masoretes added the vowels, nobody knew what the divine name, the, the divine name sounded like. And so the Masoretes would add different vowels from different words to tell whoever was reading to skip over the divine name with a different word, like Adonai. Now, we have guesses as to how this pronounced, is pronounced. Uh, the word Yahweh is probably something a lot of you have heard. That's the best scholarly guess that we have. But to be clear, we don't know if that's right. Another word uh, that you've probably heard, Jehovah. Again, same thing. That's a guess at how we pronounce this word. If anybody tells you they know for sure, they do not. We don't know. We're guessing. I'm not kidding about this. Now, why do I tell you? Why do I bring up this name detour that we just went on? It, it's to make this point that the Jewish people were so careful how they referred to God. The names they used, they were always done with a deep sense of reverence. They were so reverent that they wouldn't say God's revealed name in the chance that it could be used irreverently or that it could be mispronounced. They were so particular and careful. And yet, going back to our scripture today, here we see Paul, a Jewish man, an ex-Pharisee, who is telling us to call God Abba. The phrase a little child might use to refer to his dad. I, I think we so often skip by this point, but what Paul is saying we should do here, what he's asking us to call God, it's radical. It's crazy. This is not normal. The creator God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God so holy, we don't even know how to say his name. Call him Abba. Like, like a little child call out to him like a three-year-old might cry out for his dad. That's the relationship that you have with God. That's the familial connection that you have to him. This, this would have been insane to the average Jewish person hearing this. I mean, there are only 15 or so times in the Old Testament where God is referred to as father, and most of them are in reference to his character. It's saying what he's like, not his personal relationship with us. The closest thing that we would have is in the Psalms where he calls the king a son of God, but even then, it's, it's different than what we have here. In fact, the only other person who we know that called God Father personally and the only other one who encouraged us to do so is Jesus. In fact, the only other time we see the exact words, Abba, Father, is from the mouth of Jesus. The only other moment Abba is found is with Jesus in this intimate moment between him and the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. At this point, the disciples had fallen asleep. And the hour of Jesus' crucifixion was upon him. And we read this in Mark 14. It says in verse 35 that going a little farther, he being Jesus, fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus, in his most vulnerable, most anxious, most troubled moment, calls out to God in the most tender and intimate of terms, Abba, take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And we know the end. We know Jesus goes to the cross, but not without anxiety at the thought of it. But look in this moment how Jesus addresses the Father again. Abba. This is the connection, the access, the intimacy that Jesus had with the Father. In his most anxious and troubled moment, he cries out as a child would to his Father in heaven. And Gateway, this is the kind of access that you have. It, it, it's this Garden of Gethsemane kind of access. It's you and all your worries and anxieties and your highs and your lows. It's you and all your victories and your losses. It's, it's you, all that you are, you, you're the one, Paul, who shockingly says, has the right to call out to God as a child would their father. You, because of what Jesus has done, because the Spirit testifies with yours, because you have been adopted in the family, can call God Abba, Father. Friends, this is what reconciliation is, and it is scandalous. 
at the moment of your conversion. You aren't just invited into the family as a servant or a stepson or daughter. Rather, you are in the eyes of God, a co-heir with Christ and a dearly loved child of God. There, There is nothing you can do to add to the love that the Father holds for you today. There is no good work. There is no church service. There is no ministry team. There is no small group attendance. There is no sacrifice that you could make in your life that would make you more loved than you are right now. You have been forever and ever, amen, irrevocably been brought into the overwhelming loving relationship of God to his child. You have been adopted and reconciled so that no barrier remains between you and the Lord. No sin stands, no penalty is stuck. You are given today immediately in total access to the Father. Tim Keller, he puts it succinctly in this when he says, which is my favorite quote, and I know I've given this to you before, but I'll give it to you again. He writes this, the only person who would dare wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. We have that kind of access. We have that kind of access, friends, an access without pretense, an access without fear. This cannot be a truth that we let grow cold. This is the most amazing and incredible truth that could be contained in this universe. Friends, this is a truth we need to embrace. And I say this because I know that so many of you today are here and have been keeping God at an arm's length. You've been keeping your Abba Father at an arm's length because you've been struggling in sin. And deep down, you believe that the Lord doesn't want anything to do with you. But given what we've read today, you need to know that your heavenly father longs for you. What father, when their child stumbles, doesn't, uh, sorry, abandons them? What, what father, when their child has fallen, picks, doesn't pick them up in their arms and tend to them until they're well again? Friends, this is what your Abba Father desires to do today for you. There is no reason to run. There is no reason to stay away. Let today be the day that you allow your father to care for you. And let today be the day that you experience the love of the Father. Let the Spirit testify to this truth today as the worship team comes now to lead us in song. Come for prayer. Let the family of God remind you of who you are. Come and embrace who you are today as a child of God. Friends, I, I can't wait for the day that my daughter calls me daddy for the first time. I, I can't wait. And if, if this is true, then, then how much more is it true that your Father in heaven is waiting for the day when you embrace your identity as his child? Let today be that day. He is your Abba Father, and today you can call out to him and whatever you find yourself in. And, and if you'd like to call out to him for the first time today, I'll be right here at the front. I, I would love to pray with you to receive Jesus and become part of this family. I'd love to pray for you to become today a beloved child. God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you are our Abba Father. You are the one who loves us so dearly, God, that, God, you've sent a spirit who testifies to us, God, that, that, that shouts to us, God, that we are dearly beloved children. And so I pray, God, that you would do that through your spirit now as we sit here, God, with you, as we worship you. Would you whisper to us? Would you shout to us? Would you speak to us, God, the truth that we are, Lord, for those who are in Jesus, dearly beloved children. We thank you for this truth, and we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Why don't you stand with us? Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began know your grace so free washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your
from my chains I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom you paid for before He cancelled my debt and he called me his friend When death was arrested in my life Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross And darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand That's when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing about our hope again. Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, Come Stone, we can make strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face. Rest on His unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within 
sound Oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone fall and stand before the throne Amen faultless before the throne Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. In Christ alone, Set me free 
Friends, before you go, a couple of announcements just for you. Um, the first is that uh, tonight, the second Sunday band and the Martin Brothers are joining us for a worship night uh, here, 7 p.m. It's free. Make sure you come out. These guys are incredible. Um, it's just going to be such an amazing time with God. Um, secondly, there was an issue in the announcements. Uh, Rooted has actually been moved to Monday nights starting on April 8th in the alcove, not Sundays, Mondays. Um, thirdly, we have an Easter morning sunrise baptism service at 7.30 a.m. Um, Twelve people are being baptized. Amazing, right? So good. So good. I know it's early. Get out there. It's such an incredible service. Let's support our family here. Um, after that, there's going to be services here normally at 8.30, 10, and 11.30. But let me leave you with uh, this, uh, this blessing. May you go forth today in the care of your Abba Father. May you know today how loved and treasured you are by your Father in heaven. Amen. See you next week.